Um, so my poster is about uh, RISC-V formal, the framework to formally verify RISC-V processes uh, against the formal specification. So this is not a formally verified processor, but you can take your processor and formally verify it with that. Um, you can use uh, commercial uh, tools that can uh, verify safety properties, but this works all with a, a complete open source flow as well. Um, there is a special trace port that the core has to implement in order to be verifiable. Um, we break down the verification problem into very, very many small verification problems in order to make this uh, a doable thing. Uh, so find me at my poster and ask me how we do that. I'd be happy to talk about this. Um, you can uh, also use um, a monitor core that we can generate from our formal verif verification for tandem verification with uh, a pro any processor that can implement this trace port. Um, and we are using this right now to formally verify real world uh, processors, so it's not the vaporware, uh, quote unquote, for toy processors only. Um, I have found bugs with that in anything I looked at. Uh, so I found bug in Rocket, I found bug in Pico RV32, I found bug in uh, Vex, Vex Risk 5, which is not on this list yet. Uh, it currently supports RV32 and RV64, uh, the C extension and the M extension. Uh, if this is something that you think could interest you, find me at my poster and um, ask me questions about it. Thank you. This is Badal uh, from Microsemi India. I'm the part of SOC group. Uh, I'll be demonstrating uh, MicroPython running on the RISC-V soft core. So, so MicroPython is the lead version of uh, Python 3, uh, which is optimized for microcontroller. And so far, the poor uh, MicroPython is available for x86 and uh, ARM architecture. Okay. So we ported it on RISC-V, so porting involved uh, architecture porting and the board porting, okay. And uh, features, uh, it has, uh, means, uh, the, we added some machine modules to communicate with the ha hardware, okay. And it has an interactive prompt, REPL. Uh, so through that, you can uh, uh, throw the uh, Python commands, or also you can switch to edit mode and write the script and then run the script, okay. So, yeah. And then uh, further, we are pl we plan the, uh, uh, to add the uh, more advanced features, and then uh, we will be making available it for uh, on the GitHub. Okay. So for more information, you can uh, visit uh, the, my poster demo booth. Thanks. Sean Abras from Micrium. Uh, Micrium was uh, recently acquired by Silicon Lab about a year ago. But uh, our mandate at Micrium is to continue selling software irrespective of the CPU architecture. So we're the lead, leading embedded RTOS and stacks uh, for microcontrollers and microprocessors. So basically, the products that we do at Micrium is a combination of real time operating system, TCP IP stack, USB host, USB device. CAN bus, Modbus, and a whole bunch of other protocol stacks. We also have tools, uh, one is called MicroC Probe. It's a, it's a Windows application that allows you to look inside your target at runtime and display the current value of variables uh, using gauges, meters, graphs, and so on. It's a very useful tool for system veri verification and, and validating. We are also compatible with uh, Segur's System View, which is a really cool tool to look at RTOS events in, in real time, as well as Trace Elizer from Percipio. So uh, MicroCOS 2 and 3 are very popular RTOSs. I wrote uh, these books. Uh, one is in 1992, 1998, and then the series of books at the bottom in uh, 2008. Uh, we offer prof professional grade, uh, fully supported RTOSs. We've ported the RTOSs over 45 different CPU architectures. Uh, we've been certified for avionics, medical, industrial controls, and even nuclear applications. Uh, MicroSUS 2 actually runs on the Mars uh, Curiosity rover. It's been on there for quite a few years. 
So we wrote the number of books. There are seven MicroSUS OS three books. Each one of the books uh, actually target a specific uh, CPU uh, manufacturer. So we've done a book with uh, Freescale, uh, uh, one with ST, and so on. So just about everybody in the industry. And we have uh, five books on TCP IP and one on USB. We've actually ported the MicroSUS OS two and three on the RISC-V architecture. It runs on the Micro Semi Creative Board uh, using a soft console, but uh, we'll also be porting the operating system or the RTOSs on these uh, other platforms that I list here. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Satish from Micro Semi. Today, I'm going to show. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Satish from MicroSemi. I'm going to show two demos today. Uh, the first demo is on enabling safe crypto using RISC-V soft processor on MicroSemi flash-based FPGAs. So we need to have a secure platform for implementing secure systems. MicroSemi offers polarified FPGAs, and they represent the industry's most advanced secure programmable FPGAs. So they have built-in crypto accelerator for implementing cryptographic algorithms, and they also support sidechain and analysis resistant countermeasures. So this crypto crow processor acts as a look aside uh, accelerator, and uh, we need to have a processor for uh, implementing cryptographic uh, 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 applications. So we believe that RISC-V soft processor is a perfect companion for this uh, on-chip crypto processor for implementing data security applications, because unlike uh, Competing uh, processors, the RISC-V processor uh, RTL can be inspected for building trust on the processor implementation. And for uh, building any secure system, secure boot is the starting point. The secure boot guarantees that the boot code and all the subsequent codes are authentic for uh, implementing your application. Polar Fire FPGs have uh, built-in secure uh, capabilities for implementing secure boot of the RISC-V software processor. So I have a demo uh, that shows uh, how a RISC-V processor can be interfaced with the on-chip crypto processor and how we can boot securely a uh, RISC-V processor on Polar Fire FPGAs. The second demo that I have is about RISC-V based uh, lockstep processor implementation for increasing the reliability of the system. For safety critical applications, we need to uh, identify the faults and uh, we have to control them to avoid uh, hazardous uh, situations. And uh, nowadays, most of the sa safety critical systems are relying on embedded processors. So we need to have a mechanism to identify faults in the embedded processors. So lockstep processor implementation is one of the architecture that identifies uh, uh, faults in the embedded processor real time in real time. So in this lockstep processor architecture, we have two processor running in lockstep. And uh, we, we have a comparator that compares the address and data uh, in real time. So whenever uh, there is a, uh, a, a mismatch on the address and data, we can raise a fault that can be uh, treated for uh, 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 as a, a fault in the embedded processor. We can also implement temporal and spatial redundancy for uh, increasing the reliability by uh, identifying the common mode faults. So uh, flash-based FPGAs are uh, more attractive in uh, safety critical applications because of uh, built-in uh, security and reliability features uh, uh, built into the flash-based FPGAs. So I have a, uh, a demo of dual-core lockstep processor implementation on uh, flash-based FPJ, where we have uh, two RISC-V processor running in lockstep. And we have also implemented uh, time uh, redundancy by uh, having a two clock cycles delay between the two processors. And if you want more information about this implementation, please come and talk to me. Thank you. Hi. I'm going to go quick. Uh, I'm Eric. Uh, so my poster is in relation to a proposed ISA extension I've been working on. Uh, the brief overview of this is it is designed to provide access to uh, specialized functional units and some devices without crossing privilege levels. Uh, the idea is you have a number of engine resources. I, I call these engines, and uh, these could be, f you know, specialized functional units, crypto units, whatever. It could also be a device. Uh, 
there's mechanisms for binding these to handles and then uh, states for controlling uh, power consumption and, and other such things, uh, virtualization and uh, OS security mechanisms. So really briefly, how, uh, how this originated. Yeah. So it started with an attempt to design a crypto extension. As I generalized it, it turned into sort of a generalized engines uh, mechanism. I put it through a couple of rounds of discussion on ISA dev, and th that came back with some good ideas. And it's, at this point, I feel evolved into sort of an IO uh, instruction set. So uh, this is still work in progress, so please come and talk to me if you have ideas. I'm interested to hear them. So, hi, I would like to talk about Cloud V, which is a SOC design environment through a web browser. I'll be discussing it on behalf of the primary authors, uh, Mohamed Shalan of the American University of Cairo and Professor Sharif Reda from Brown University. So, like I said, Cloud V is a cloud-based uh, uh, SOC design environment through a web browser. So there's a few high-level goals of the project. Uh, the first one is to provide a comprehensive suite of EDA tools all the way from the high-level SOC like block-level designs and um, down through RTL and um, all the way down to the back-end uh, tools. And it provides all of these through a common, uh, very slick web interface that you can access from any device in the world. Uh, second objective is to provide a open collaborative environment and kind of a hub for people to share open IP. So uh, a third goal is to really push for um, like uh, open uh, tooling. So they, the tools by default, the EDA tools by default that they have um, that they're using are open source tools in the community right now, such as Ivera Log and Yosis. So there's also a few other useful utilities that are provided um, in, by the developers of the Cloud V platform. The first one is the Dwarf RV32 uh, core, which is a custom RISC-V basic CPU core that you can use as an IP within your own um, designs. Uh, there's also a custom SOC editor, which provides a lot of really useful, um, it's, it's a very useful utility uh, for kind of doing high level block level designs of your SOC in integrating different like analog and IO IP into it. And uh, a third one is called Beekeeper, which is a uh, utility, uh, another custom utility for doing hardware uh, software code simulation. So in your browser, you can uh, step through like a RISC-V binary and um, look at all the, the signals on the bus wires. Uh, so this is an active development. And please check out uh, cloudv.io or visit the poster session if you have more questions. Thank you. Okay, Minris is a uh, company uh, act, being active uh, in the field of virtual platform development. Uh, we, dev uh, we support our customers in implementing and uh, using uh, implementing virtual platforms and using them for embedded software development before and after having silicon. And in the course of this, uh, we developed a framework uh, to easily implement uh, custom processes. Uh, we called it uh, uh, DBT RISE, RISE for retargetable ISS environment. And um, combined with some code generation facility uh, being part of the framework, we are able to generate in, in, uh, quite easily and fast variations of instruction set simulators. In the picture, you see uh, color, uh, this orange kind color, this is the framework. The green part is the generated one, and the blue one is uh, the stuff need, which needs to be um, implemented by hand, and by accident, it somehow uh, resembles the, the amount of code being part in the, uh, uh, of the various parts. Now, the, uh, this can then be embedded, and this is the, the important part here, into some uh, virtual platform, um, and uh, in, based, for example, on System C. 
Um, one might ask why another ISS? The point is that uh, based on the experiences we had in the past with our customers, we focused on uh, easy integration uh, performance of the uh, simulation itself and accuracy as well as adaptability and extensibility. And uh, as an uh, to uh, prove that this is not just a claim, rather we can do it uh, in this way, we implemented the, uh, the high five as a programmer view, in, uh, as a VP in a programmer view, which means based on the uh, based on the uh, public available specification, we uh, created all the peripherals and uh, are able to run uh, the, the software here. So if there is interest, just stop by at the poster out there and uh, we can have a look at that. Otherwise, if you have questions, I'm around there. Thanks. Uh, hi. Hi everyone, my name is Pranav and my uh, project is on detecting advanced malware, that is those malware which evade all software defenses uh, as instruction and microarchitectural anomalies, basically trying to model it as a computational anomaly. So software and OS defenses detect malware, detect routine off the shelf malware like trojans, viruses, worms and backdoors with good accuracy. Uh, uh, say if we have an attack at the library's level, as long as we have some kind of defense uh, in the software stack below it, we will be able to detect the attack. But what they cannot do is they cannot detect advanced malware like uh, side channel data leaks, row hammer and analog hardware attacks which directly affect the CPU. So what about these attacks? And uh, the answer to uh, the defense to these attacks is hardware-based malware detectors, which have been recently proposed. Um, so closing off individual side channels would have limited coverage and would probably incur overheads. And this would actually be tackling the symptom rather than tackling the problem itself. Thus, what we do is we look at modeling the execution of a program accurately to label it as benign or malicious. So uh, I can talk about this later when you, uh, if you would come by my poster. And our results on x86 have been good. We have tried it against advanced malware such as uh, the floating point uh, timing side channel, the Rohammer attack, JIT spray, uh, the prefetch side channel attack, cache and memory bus cover channel attacks. With, uh, we have achieved two positives of almost greater than 99%, false positives of less than 1%, and very high AUCs. Now the shortcomings with our current approach and with the current systems is that Intel only allows counting up to four performance counters at one time, and since we are using, we are evaluating it on x86, uh, that is a bottleneck for us. We are unable to distinguish interference or contention with uh, other security domains and within itself. The coarse granularity uh, of the, uh, the performance counters plays a bottleneck especially for those memory exploits which happen within like hundreds of cycles. And it has low flexibility in the amount of signals or low level microarchitectural features we can use to uh, train our classifier. So what we need is, is that the low level microarchitectural monitoring should be fine grained. Monitoring at multiple granularity should be possible. It should be programmable and it should be low overhead. So we propose a RISC-V-based solution, which is fine-grained. That is, we add signals in hardware, which we can later extract the data from. For example, contention counters. It should be programmable. That is, the software will choose the uh, hardware signals, which will leak the information. And it should be low over overhead in that we would design a hardware coprocessor, which would extract features and run the anomaly detection. You can come by my poster, and I can tell you more details. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Boris Shingerov with Labware. Uh, I've been doing uh, Deutsch Schiffman style dynamic translators for dynamic languages for the last like 20 years. And uh, the problem that has been bothering me all of this time is that practically all of this that, that um, exists now, they are actually a conflation of the author's idea of what the byte code or whatever intermediate representation you have has to do uh, versus what the processor does. So you, you take whatever idea about the first and the other uh, and uh, um, 
that that's what result, and, and what result is uh, quite often a mess. So um, the approach, there is uh, uh, two approaches that um, I tried. And the first one is a target diagnostic approach in which uh, we take a formal description of the processor and um, use logic programming, uh, programming to infer the back end of the translator. So it's a, it's a prologue program that takes the PDL and spits out uh, the back end translator. Um, the second approach is uh, I tried to experiment uh, with um, CompCert source and I took, um, se uh, I separated several of the last transformations uh, and uh, wrote another transformation from the stack-oriented bytecode of whatever dynamic uh, language you might, uh, you might have. Uh, it's uh, uh, Professor John Sarkula's uh, mod talk in this case in, of this experiment. And uh, I do uh, just another transformation, just another of those that uh, we already have, many of them in uh, CompCert, uh, proven for using formal methods uh, in the same way as all of the other um, transformations, uh, and uh, make it into uh, one of the intermediate representations of CompCert. And everything else on the back end is just done by uh, CompCert. And uh, one of the backends is uh, RISC-V, um, which uh, works wonderfully. If you want to see it, uh, come to the poster. Hello. Uh, my name is Marcela Zachariasheva. Uh, I represent Kodasip company. And uh, together with Harald Weiss uh, and his team from Cortic, we created a very nice demo uh, for the poster session. It's a uh, FPGA-based CNN hardware accelerator with the RISC-V processor. Okay, one picture is missing, nevertheless. Uh, we will present uh, products of both of our companies. So uh, we will present uh, Codasip Berkelium, RISC-V processor family, and Codasip Studio development and customization environment. And from the Cortex side, uh, they will present AI Scale, uh, which is a PGA-based hardware accelerator. Uh, the demo actually uh, consists of uh, the FPGA board, uh, which contains the compressed uh, network and also Codacy Berkelium core, uh, which is the main uh, interface controller. Uh, the FPGA board is connected to the camera system and the purpose of the demo is uh, object recognition of the images captured by camera. So you're very welcome, Dever Poster. Hi, I'm Craig Steele, Totline LLC. I'm uh, reporting on a port of the Riot operating system to the RISC-V, specifically the uh, Hi-5 one board. Uh, the Riot OS is a compact, modular, IoT-oriented microkernel OS for eight to 30-bit 32-bit uh, microcontrollers, that is, with no MMU. It has a small memory footprint uh, on the order practically 8 to 30-ish uh, 30, 30 kilobytes of uh, footprint for uh, code and RAM for usable applications. It has the familiar C, C++ uh, programming environment with the usual GCC, GDB, uh, and uh, open OCD uh, tools available. One nice feature about it is that it has a native mode uh, software development uh, para-virtualized version that runs on your Mac OS or Linux or uh, I believe Windows uh, uh, workstation environment where you have all of the, the uh, those platforms, uh, development tools 
and debugging tools and where the stray pointers actually do something when they reference a bad memory location. My personal interest in Riot is uh, actually because of its small size and um, efficiency in use of uh, resources is to use it for deeply embedded uh, security research uh, with RISC-V variants. It's small, it's efficient, and uh, it doesn't get in the way of uh, your personal expressions of brilliance. Uh, the poster has uh, some early performance results in tuning Riot uh, so it can actually make use of the, f the fast SRAM on uh, the high five and avoid uh, disasters uh, which happen when you actually have to uh, get an iCache miss and have to bring it in out of... Uh, out of the extremely slow SPI flash. So if any of this uh, piques your interest, please come by the poster. Hello, uh, my name is Alexander and I'm from Syntacore. And our company, for those of you who are new to the uh, workshops, uh, specializes in the RISC-V compatible IP development. Yeah, so if you've been to workshops, maybe you've seen uh, some information about our course in certain level of details, but uh, for those of you who are new uh, to RISC-V, just a quick uh, recap. So currently we have uh, four cores available in our product line, three uh, microcontroller uh, space and one application core. Uh, from microcontroller space, uh, one of the cores uh, we've open sourced. Uh, we announced that back at the previous workshop in Shanghai, and uh, mm. it became quite popular in the ecosystem. I know up to a dozen of different teams uh, who are currently utilizing it, and a few are taking it through the tape out process currently. And uh, uh, we also have uh, uh, Linux capable core with uh, memory coherency uh, uh, caches uh, and uh, SMB support. And all those designs are uh, clean slate, stable, and uh, uh, available for evaluation right away with all the collateral which is typically expected, SDKs, uh, tools, documentation, and um, even silicon samples. Uh, but today, in the poster session, uh, I will be talking about extensibility features. So some of the people today uh, stress that continuously, what extensibility is one of the important features which uh, this ecosystem provides, and uh, we understand that. That's why we call our course baseline course. So for, do for all of those uh, we can uh, do as a service uh, considerable uh, customization and here I just highlight uh, at the very um, high level some of the extensibility features which include both computational capabilities which is uh, more or less standard as well as extended storage things like uh, uh, addressable uh, memories and register files uh, and uh, uh, explicitly uh, addressable state and custom AGU and other features uh, as well as uh, additional I.O. ports and uh, even specialized uh, system uh, behavior. And in the poster session, I will be prepared to, to discuss that in the next level of details. We also have uh, some examples and this uh, uh, all the data come from real prototypes, uh, which also can be demonstrated where by combining all those means together, we are able uh, to show significant improvements uh, from such uh, customization. So here, for example, we uh, did evaluation project for one of the potential customers where we accelerated uh, set of uh, uh, cryptography algorithms and uh, we demonstrated uh, speed ups from 60 to uh, more than 500 uh, times. These are like real numbers from the hardware 
uh, at the cost of uh, pretty modest increase of the uh, core footprint. Thank you. Hey, everybody. My name is Joe. I work for a company called Galois. Galois has been around for 19 years. Most of what we do is R&D for national security. Government is our client most of the time. And we haven't done a lot of hardware until recently. And we got into hardware about three years ago. We have two posters out there. And I have a couple colleagues with me. And I'll summarize them now. Uh, the first poster is about a project called Shave that we're wrapping up now. It was done for DARPA. Shave is about how do you build a high assurance system that includes both user level software, firmware, and hardware. And the entire stack has to be formally verified. When I say formally verified, I don't mean it in a hardware formal sense. I mean it from the field of software formal verification with full formal specs, proofs, and the like. So this particular plat uh, demonstration platform is a bump and wire encryptor. And so we have inside of it a uh, formally verified uh, AES on top of a Piccolo. This is work done with uh, BlueSpec. Uh, we're now moving into a new phase, working on a new project where DARPA uh, is purportedly, at, I say purportedly because we're starting next week, uh, asking us to build a full-blown verification pipeline that'll let one verify arbitrary RISC-V cores. Uh, and in particular, verify formal, formally specified security properties. So this says like the biggest formal method shop in the world is moving hard into formally verifying security on CPUs. The idea behind this project, which is called Bespin, which is uh, riffing on a Star Wars meme, is about how do you s state as a hardware designer what your hardware security goals are at a high level, in a single page, in a usable fashion from a hardware engineer point of view, and have a means by which to reason about that fully automatically so that you do not have to understand any new math or anything else. It's kind of like Jasper Gold on steroids, except for security. The second poster we have outside is a project where DARPA asked us to build a formally verified trusted boot for RISC-V. Other people are working on this too. Our main focus is on assurance. So in this particular project, it's built inside that shave demonstrator I mentioned earlier, which has this formally verified software stack at the top, formally specified but not verified firmware in the middle, mainly because we ran out of time on the project. Inside of that firmware, we have formally verified uh, hash as well as HMAC. And then at the bottom, we have uh, Piccolo with a extended formally verified AES 256 and a trusted boot reset and attestation API. That API looks very much like uh, attestation and uh, uh, trusted reset on x86. So basically you can say, you can boot the processor, configure memory as you like, and then make a attestation claim about a region of memory so that you can then spin up after that. And after you've done trusted boot with that reset, you can then attest the state of the machine down the road by using an HMAC. Um, this entire stack is small, clean, formally verified. And the cool thing about it, I think, is that um, all the crypto inside was not handwritten. It was actually formally synthesized from formal specifications and is the highest performance crypto available today. As a part of this project, we've also built a formal verification system for core blue spec. So you can take blue spec specifications, state the correctness properties you want about them, push a button, go have a cup of tea, and come back and get a proof. If you want to learn more, come outside and talk to us. Hi, I'm Bob from Lauterbach. Um, there are a lot of very sophisticated, elaborate posters here with a lot of code on them. And if you want a way to debug that code, well, we have a debugger. So that's what I'll, I have as my poster. The thing I talked about earlier, our uh, power debug module running on a Sci-5 core 
on an already A7 FPGA processor. Um, something I talked about earlier, I'll let you come by and take a look. Thanks. Oops, there's the IDE. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Simon Davidman. I'm from a company called Imperus. And what we provide is uh, commercial simulation solutions. We're a 10-year-old company. We've invested some 100 man years of effort in building simulators and models for processor architectures. Our solutions range from very simple uh, processor models all the way to SMP 64-bit uh, simulators running um, um, Linux and SMP Linux and things like that. We've got customers that range from very simple processors stuff all the way up to um, architectural licensees at the high end of current processors that are out there. Um, we license our product from single licenses through to enterprise-wide regression system farms for people who are doing a lot of software development. And our focus really is on the embedded uh, software and the development of it. We believe that nobody should be building um, software without simulating it in the same way no one builds silicon without simulating it. We're based in the UK uh, near Oxford. And what we provide for embedded software developers is, I mean, the fundamental thing is fast processor models. And we have a library of some 200 of those uh, ranging. There's about 10 different ISAs that we support in there. And a key thing about our technology is it's integratable into other environments. And so people can use it in their simulation environments, whether it's at a hardware RTL level or more system level in there. We provide also a debug solution in there for multi-core, multi-processor, uh, homogeneous and heterogeneous systems, and you can see what's going on in the software, but also what's going on in the platform in there as well as a, a source level or down at the instruction level. We provide um, from simple ISS, single processor, through to complete simulation platforms in there, and we have, a, as I said, a large library of processor models, but also behavioral components ranging from the Ethernet to USB and things like that. Uh, we have tools which are OS aware, so it's very easy to port an operating system to a, a new uh, platform in there. And it's designed, the simulator is designed to be used in, in regression systems and continuous integration uh, systems. Uh, what we offer for the RISC V processor developers, and we've been evolving this uh, over the last year, we joined the RISC V organization uh, the, near the beginning of this year. And as I said, it's commercially supported. Yes, there are open source solutions out there, but our focus is on providing high quality models, high quality support, and high performance. We, we believe we're one of the fastest simulators out there. We can run at several billion instructions a second for some things. Full OSs of Linux and stuff will run at four, 500 million instructions a second. So we're very fast on, on desktop. Uh, we've implemented uh, the RISC V, a 32-bit, 64-bit, all the variety of different instruction sets. We've not yet finished the um, virtual memory stuff for porting Linux. We expect that'll be a couple of weeks uh, before that's done. So we have the simulator and the models. What we also have is tools to help you build better solutions. So we actually have uh, code coverage of the instruction set of the CPU model. We can uh, do, yes, the platform and application and stuff. We also, uh, and what we're uh, releasing uh, and announcing now is not only instruction accurate simulation models, but also cycle approximate, where we can do timing estimation of simple processes and be able to get the uh, timing data, the number of cycles that have been run, not just the number of instructions that have been run, and still run ex exceptionally fast, and not just stand alone, in a whole uh, platform as it's running. And we also have interfaces into the, the traditional performance simulators like Gem5 and things like that. And we're also are developing a, a sort of a corner case uh, regression testing verification suite because we think that it's very important to not only have conformance to the RISC V standard, but also to be able to explore how the RTL you're building and the corners that, that, you, that, that you need to explore to ensure that it is correct and there aren't uh, bugs uh, lying in it. And we're also making our solution available so it can be uh, resold or redistributed by partners. And we have uh, existing partners in the simulation space in different ISAs where they take our simulator and actually provide that as a solution, as a commercial solution to their customers. And we've recently been working with Microsemi and we're building a simulation platform of, of their platforms, a simulation model of it, and we can run free Artos. And one of the things we'll be showing out in, in the session out there will actually be different simulation uh, running. So if you want more information, come and see us uh, out there. Thank you. Hi. 
I'm Julian Scherding, and we are Dover Microsystems, and our poster will detail the approach and solution we've developed um, that empowers processors to block every uh, class of network-based attack, essentially making processors immune to cyber attacks. Um, I just want to set the stage a little by diving into this term, secure processing. We believe it's been, that's a term that's had its wings clipped a little bit in industry right now. Um, so when we say that, we mean going beyond encryption, beyond attestation, compartmentalization, stuff like that, um, and, and providing security that can really block against every attack coming in over the network. Um, so this is the, the little bit of the reality that we're working in. Um, processors today are blindly running vulnerable software, and, and most people are just responding with more layers of application-level software. Um, so not only is that, is that increasing an attack vector, but it's actually degrading performance. Um, Mr. Ellison said it best himself, that you can't really change the process over the network, which is why we think this is the best place to provide security. So we've developed an IP solution um, that it bolts onto existing processors. It's compatible with leading embedded processor architectures, and it's optimized and was prototyped on RISC-V. Um, it's a flexible design that allows you to optimize for power, performance, area, and even the level of security that you want for your solution. Um, and, and the way it works is that it maintains metadata for every word in memory and checks each instruction against the customer-defined uh, security rules. Um, so we do this using two proprietary components. The first is a set of uh, micro-policies. These are essentially um, the the rules that, that we allow you, the customer to define, uh, define themselves. And, and we also offer a, a standard set of, of uh, micro-policy security rules. And the second is the hardware uh, piece, the policy enforcer, that um, prevents all malicious instructions from being processed um, right at the CPU level in real time. So we left out the, the block diagram as a bit of a carrot to get you to come look at our poster. <laughs> uh, so please stop by and say hi. Thanks. Hello again. Uh, I'm chair of the Compliance Task Group, so this is a short update uh, about our activities. Uh, so at the beginning, it's good to introduce uh, Compliance Task Group. So uh, the purpose of Compliance Test uh, is to uh, confirm that uh, your implementation of the RISC-V processor actually follows the specification. So that's the main goal of our group. Uh, this group started on the last workshop. Uh, Vice Chair is Stuart Holt from Microsemi. Uh, this group currently has 19 members. Uh, we already did uh, several actions, uh, so we have had several meetings and email discussions. Uh, we created one kickoff document and two proposals on the specification uh, of, the, of the structure of the tests. And uh, I can encourage you to come to the poster session to get uh, more details about our activities. And also, I will try to explain the difference between compliance and verification, because these two terms are uh, quite commonly exchanged. Also, I have one uh, announcement to make. Uh, CODASIP uh, provided the first compliance tests for RV32E. Uh, these tests uh, reflect discussions and proposals done in compliance task group. Uh, this package is currently under revision by uh, compliance task group members uh, like Imperas, Mentor, and Microsemi. Uh, and I will also present the future plans at the poster session. So. We've discussed a lot of things like if to have the reference model, uh, more reference model, just spike and formal reference model, and uh, we should improve the specification coverage because right now it is uh, tracked manually. And of course, we need to implement uh, compliance tests also for other instructions, and we also need to define more comprehensive test framework so please come to the poster session to get more details, and also please come to the um, compliance task group meeting on Thursday. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arun Thomas. Um, so I'm the chair of the risk Five Foundation Software Task Group, and I'll be giving a quick update. Um, so 
I am now, let's see. Oops, here we go. Okay, so the task group charter is uh, essentially, uh, it's a fairly simple charter. We're building the uh, RISC-V software ecosystem and we're standardizing RISC-V software interfaces. Um, and there's been a lot of software uh, ecosystem progress recently, um, thanks to all the community efforts. Um, so there's been upstream support for our GCC, LLVM, which is in progress, bin utils. Uh, the Linux kernel was upstreamed, as you heard earlier, uh, FreeBSD, Zephyr, Artems. There's also a lot of other stuff that's in progress um, that I wasn't able to capture on this slide, but you can find the full status on the uh, software status uh, page. Um, so what's next? Basically more of the same. We're gonna be doing more software porting and upstreaming, building out the software ecosystem. Um, in particular, we'll be focusing on Linux distributions, so working with upstream, uh, uh, the upstream community to uh, get RISC-V support into Debian, Fedora, OpenWRT, and Open Embedded. Um, we'll also be working on the GDB and QMU ports, and then in general, other software ports that the community would like to work on. Um, we'll also be working on fleshing out the RISC-V processor-specific ABI specification, and the uh, supervisor binary interface as well. Um, so I hope you'll consider joining the uh, software task group and talk to me at the poster session. Um, just as a quick heads up, individuals can also join the RISC-V Foundation. You don't have to be, uh, your employer doesn't have to be a member. You can join as an individual. As an individual. And uh, membership fees are waived for open source contributors. So if you're an open source contributor, please join. We'd like to get you um, involved in the uh, software task group. Um, and the membership application link is there. Um, so we have monthly uh, teleconferences. Um, they meet on the, we meet on the fourth Wednesday of every month at 9 a.m. Pacific. And uh, our next meeting is actually gonna be in person on Thursday at 3.15 um, here. So please join if you can. Um, and please feel free to contact me and uh, Palmer, my vice chair. And we'd love to talk to you about uh, kind of building out the RISC-V software ecosystem. Cool, thanks. Hi, I'm Dave Patterson. I'm going to tell you about books. Uh, the, uh, there's two of, of the architecture books that Hennessy and I did are RISC-V, as Krista said. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the second one's going to be available in two weeks. Uh, the good news is there's a brand new book. Uh, Andrew and I, at the last workshop, said, you know, I think there'd be a usefulness if we could make a very slim architecture book that also kind of say why RISC-V is a good idea. So we, de we made the pledge to write the book and we hoped we could have it done in time for here, so we self-published it. We tested it in Berkeley classes that Krista taught in September. That was the beta edition and the first edition was done in time. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, the idea was to keep it short. It covers all the, ex all the extensions that have been defined. It has, it's both a reference book, it defines all the CSRs, every single instruction is in detail there, as well as a general introduction and some code examples versus x86, ARM, and MIPS. And uh, so we were able to get some people to read the book, and, uh, and they liked both you know, the shortness of the book <laughs> and the uh, kind of the historical perspective of it. And the good news is we will deliver it faster than Amazon. <laughs> After I get done here, I will lug the books across and find a place over there, and Andrew and I will sell them for cash, US dollars, not Zimbabwe dollars. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we'll sign them for you. Uh, and uh, we'll have a very large poster, so you should be able to find us. Thanks. All right, hello everybody. Uh, I spoke this morning. Uh, this morning I talked about a chip. In Sci Fi, we're, we're demoing what uh, our licensable IP, so our RISC V core IP. Uh, we have two families of IP. Uh, one is what we call the E series, one is the U series. The E series is for embedded devices, embedded computing, so E for embedded. Um, and the U series is for uh, Unix class operation, so Linux. Uh, those type of operating systems. So uh, we'll have the E31, which is a 32-bit embedded core, the E51, 64-bit embedded core, and then the U54MC, which is the multi-core uh, core complex that I described this morning uh, that's in our U500 chip. Um, so what are we going to be demoing? Uh, we're going to be demoing debugging and development. Um, so with our partners, uh, debugging with Lauterbach, um, Sager, which is both debugging and ID environment, uh, as well as Freedom Studio, which is the open source tool that Sci-Fi provides. Um, in addition to that, we'll also be demoing uh, multiple operating systems, both RTOS and Linux, so on our embedded cores, um, free RTOS on our 
FE310, uh, RISC V silicon, also on our FPGA platform, which has uh, our cores on it. Uh, these badges that you have actually run Zephyr. Um, and then uh, the Freedom U500 FPGA, which is an FPGA version uh, of the chip that I described this morning. Uh, we're going to be running Linux on that. So come by, ask us about our cores. Good evening. Hi, my name's Guy, and I'm from Vectorblox. I have a demo of a person detector. I've got two different instances. One is in my hand here that's shown on this slide, and another version has been sitting in my shirt pocket all day watching you. Uh, it's a camera that looks for a person in its field of view, and it uh, blinks an LED when it sees a person. What is it really? It's a RISC-V system. Uh, it's our RV, R32, uh, uh, RV32IM. Uh, that we developed at Vectorblox. It's, that's fully open source and available. It's called Orca. It's under uh, BSD license. In, on top of that, we've added our uh, vector instruction set and a CNN accelerator. And the CNN accelerator performs over 40, 40 operations per clock cycle. All of this fits in less than 5,000 lookup tables and runs at 24 megahertz on this platform. The speed up from the vector and CNN accelerator is 73 times on average over the entire uh, decode. And so it's equivalent to a 1.75 gigahertz RISC-V processor. And it's been running off a cell phone battery in my pocket all day. Uh, so it's a very low power system. I have a more detailed talk tomorrow, but if you want to see a live demo and talk to me a little bit today, I'll be in the poster session. Thank you. All right, last one. So I'm, pa I'm Murli Vijay Raghun. I'm part of a team at MIT which has been working on formal specification of risc process processors and formal verification. So if you look at typical hardware verification, this is what happens. So you write your hardware in uh, Perl or Chisel, and it's like meta programming. You generate RTL from it. And then that goes through some proprietary software to get physical design. And then finally, you, get, you, you do some magic to get silicon out of that. So typically, formal verification targets the RTL le level. Uh, you can have uh, system error log assertions and so on, which targets RTL. But what we are trying to do is elevate the level of verification to the metaprogramming level. Uh, we, uh, we are supplying a platform called Kami which is based on the Cog theorem prover. Uh, it was mentioned in one of the other fields, uh, POSIS fields earlier. And this language is inspired by BlueSpec, which was also mentioned in one of the POSIS fields. Um, so we are providing a way to formally verify full system, uh, full hardware system at the meta programming level. And we, we were able to actually verify this uh, multi-core end process system containing pipeline processors connected to two levels of cache hierarchy, and the pi uh, processors were clearly implementing this 5 ISA. And uh, if you want to learn more about this, come to the poster session. And there's also a talk tomorrow by my professor, Adam Chipala, so you can attend the talk too. All right, thank you. <laughs>